This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. And welcome to another episode of Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. With me today in the Think Tech studios is Pam Chambers. Hi. Welcome, Pam. Nice to have you back here. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Pam is an uh, author, presenter, coach, speaker, all, all these wonderful things, has done uh, a number of, written a number of books, Speak for Yourself, Stand and Deliver, Life is a Presentation, and her most recent, Not This Again. And this is Lessons on Leadership yes. uh, for Hawaii. And we're going to be talking about leadership in Hawaii. But first, I, I want to tell you a little story, Pam. Okay. And you'll, you'll think this has nothing to do with what we're going to talk about, but it really does. So you know ants live in colonies, right? And lots and lots of ants together in pretty tight space. So when an ant dies, of course, they can't just leave it there to rot, right? The little other worker ants pick the dead body up, take it outside, and throw it in the trash, basically, right? So scientists, being the curious sorts they are, got to wondering how do they know this ant is dead and not just sleeping, you know, or whatever. So they very carefully swabbed the backs of dead ants, thinking they're probably a chemical thing, because ants are very chemically sensitive, swabbed a bunch of this off some dead ants, and they swabbed that same material onto some li on a live ant, and they set this live ant back down, and she ran back in, into the uh, colony. And immediately the worker ants picked her up, although she's kicking and struggling and all, carried her up and dumped her in the trash pile. Mm -hmm. And she righted herself and ran back into the colony, and the worker ants picked her up, carried her back out, and dumped her in the trash pile again. And it was very clear, they, they were getting the message that she was dead, basically, from this chemical, this pheromone. And all she knew perfectly well, she wasn't. But anyhow, so what does that have to do with what we're going to talk about here, presentation and leadership, right? I can't wait to find <laughs> out. <laughs> well, a theme in this, in this wonderful book, uh, not this again, is that there's a real feedback loop that goes on between uh, leaders and the people that are working for them, the, the followers, we'll call them. Uh, just as there is a feedback loop, and you were talking about this at a uh, speakers association meeting a while ago, the, mm -hmm. the feedback between a presenter and the audience. Mm -hmm. And it's not just a one-way flow of information. Both parties have to be both presenting and receiving, sort of whether or not they know it, right? And if this communication breaks down in any way, things don't go well, right? Mm -hmm. And so in this case, the chemical signal was completely overriding the physical signals, although the ant was waving its feet oh, and, and all. Yes, the, 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 the ant was the, totally the, the, misunderstood. The worker ants basically ignored that signal yeah. and just said, nope, you, you've, got, you've got the death stink on you, basically, right. we're taking you out. You know? Right, right. And, you know, nice, just a complete breakdown of communication there. That's a great analogy. Well, yeah, it, it, it just stop. <laughs> I was thinking about it. I, I like these little campfire stories sometimes. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, tell us maybe how you came to write this book or why, why you chose to write it. I was in a workshop uh, and I was announcing to the people in the workshop what their survey results were. Mm -hmm. And they just looked at me blankly and I said, do you not know about these surveys and the results? And they just looked at me blankly and I said, we don't get enough feedback. Mm -hmm. And then I kept thinking about that. I thought it's true almost everywhere I go that mm -hmm. people are not being given enough feedback or information that would help them be better caregivers in this case. So then I kind of thought about all the different places I've been and taught and trained. And I thought, I bet there are other problems that are equally prevalent. So I made a list. Uh -huh. and, it, and it was 20. I went, <laughs> shrunk it down to 18 <laughs> challenges that business leaders mm -hmm. in Hawaii face in particular. Right. So there, there is, yeah, it, uh, there is a, a very Hawaii focus there. Right. And then I asked certain leaders, I asked many leaders, mm -hmm. will you supply me with a story? Right. And you'd be surprised how many people, maybe you wouldn't. <laughs> Not surprisingly, a lot of people didn't want to do that because they didn't want to be public about what their problems are. Mm -hmm. So the book is full of Valerie and Robert, <laughs> but then you'll see in the shaded sections of the book are true stories with real names and real company names. Yeah, yeah, and I mean it, it, it brings up the, the, the true, sort of the truism that was uh, popularized in that old movie Cool Hand Luke some while ago about what we have here is a failure to communicate, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is all, often you read these lessons as you're talking about them and right, the boss is saying something and the employee isn't hearing it or the employee is saying something and the boss isn't hearing mm -hmm. it or they're misunderstanding one another. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so it, it, it is a very, uh, a very uh, prevalent 
uh, commonplace thing. I've certainly experienced it in it. And, organizations, small and large, that I've worked in. Uh, yeah, in yeah. families, in neighborhoods, in board meetings, it right. happens everywhere. Right. And it's not only in Hawaii, of course, right. but this is about some of the reasons why we have problems and challenges of our own right. here. And, and there, there's some very interesting cultural issues that you, you touch on here about that, that, that we have a, a really peculiar or a peculiar juxtaposition here where we've got a bunch of different cultures all meeting together with their own styles of mm -hmm. communication. Mm -hmm. uh, we sometimes, uh, we, I do a lot of work out in Micronesia, and we talk about the Micronesian yes, oh. which, which is basically because they tend to be very polite people, and they don't want to offend you. So if you ask them, uh, are, can we do something or whatever, and they'll always say yes, even when they've got absolutely no intention of doing it. Oh, wow. Uh, and you have to learn to dig a little deeper, or ask it in different ways, or ask their friend, will they oh. do this or whatever, uh, to find out if it's really <laughs> was well, wow. this a yes that I can believe, or is it just a yes that they were saying? If not? you were to pay attention to their body language, would that Probably be helpful? Th there might be there might be good good clues. We should get to RB Kelly yeah, yeah, in, yeah. in on this sometime. Right, right. <laughs> Ask her about it. So uh, there are a lot of parallels though between doing a public presentation and being a leader, right? I mean, b both people are sort of in charge, as mm -hmm, it were. Mm -hmm. Both are, though, very dependent on their followers or their audience, right, to, mm -hmm. to, to be uh, supportive of them in some sense. Mm -hmm. And there are dangers if either of them doesn't communicate properly, right? Right, right. So talk, talk a little bit about some, some of this, uh, some of the sort of what the psychology that you were saying. That, okay, well, you, one of your questions to me in advance, thank you for those, uh, had to do with what types of presentations are leaders really needing to be good at. Mm -hmm. So I, I made a few notes to answer okay. that. So I'm thinking of a, a new employee orientation. So you have 20 new employees in a large firm. Well, they need to know the rules. They need to know what's expected of them. And, and that, so they go to these new employee orientations. And if the speaker, the leader, whoever's leading that, seems either bored or apathetic or unclear or unmotivating, then I, I, just imagine how you might feel sitting in that room. Right. Oh, gee, have I made a big mistake. So there's that. Uh, giving any types of new directions, new instructions, new procedures. Mm -hmm. We have to say what it is and why. And a lot of times the why is left out. And mm -hmm. so people aren't, they're just not, they don't have the oomph that it takes to follow through because they don't understand the why behind the what. So right. They, they don't have, they don't hear it, they don't own it, they don't believe in it, basically. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And then staff meetings. Some people have a weekly staff meeting and people are so, they complain bitterly about these endless meetings mm -hmm. that don't go anywhere, that go in circles. And I would call that poor leadership. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, but it's essentially poor public presentation, right? <laughs> yes, they're not public speaking right. well enough. Right. And then times when you want to motivate and rally your team, your your staff, maybe you you have a cause that you want them to get on board. Aloha United Way rallies are, are a good example right. of that. So yes, and a lot of leaders, they don't study enough how to be better at that. And they may not get feedback about how they're not as good as they could be. Who's who's going to tell them? Right, yeah. <laughs> and will they hear it even if they are told it? Will they, right, will they, will they right. dismiss that in some, in some way? Right. Will they just not hear it? So knock on wood that that's yeah. a problem because that's often when I get brought in is, right. could you tell him that? <laughs> Do people really do say they bring oh, you in yes. to, to oh, deliver? One example that is so profoundly unbelievable to me is a man asked me to come in and work one on one with one of his vice presidents. So mm -hmm. both leaders are fairly high up there. And I said, What do you want me to help him with? And he said, You'll see. So when I went in there, the man was sitting, it's hard to do this with my jacket so tight, but he was sitting with his hands laced behind his head leaning back in his chair, this mm -hmm. client of mine. Mm -hmm. And he sat that way for several minutes. And I finally, when I felt like the, the, the rapport was good enough, I said, can I give you some feedback about your body language? Now, wouldn't you, if someone said that to you, wouldn't you make some change? Oh, yeah. He didn't even change. He <laughs> kept sitting that same way. And I said, I'm concerned that you will be misunderstood when you sit that way, that mm -hmm. people might think that you're aloof or not engaged or that you think this is beneath you somehow. And he sat up straight and he leaned in and he said, no one's ever told me that before. 
And I said, I know. <laughs> right? Even your boss. Why would that be so hard to say to somebody? Yeah, yeah. But it's true. I mean, uh, you know, people do read these nonverbal cues. That's a clear part of that communication. Right. Like, he like, could be like fully engaged, yeah. but, but he doesn't look like it. Right. So that's what I'm going to believe, not whatever might be happening in his head. Right. And again, he may, in, in his own brain, be 100% there, focused on what you're saying and everything, and he may have just learned this relaxed posture or whatever. Yeah. That, that's his sort of quirky thing, right? But imagine uh, but, yeah. a leader, a so-called leader, who doesn't know how to say, I, I don't want you to sit that way in front of clients. Right, right. That, Here, here's how I want you to sit. Right. Yeah, it's, it's like people telling their front, front office staff about not telling them about dress codes and all, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. You know, and then being upset with them when they come in dressed inappropriately. Right, I mean, right. Or not telling them why you need to have someone at the right. desk the minute the office is open, right. not someone skidding in at the last minute. Right. You know, why? So that you look ready, prepared, hospitable. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, 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 uh, yes, so. Um, you asked how people can learn these things. Right, how, right. how would a leader learn how to be a better communicator? Right. And, and there are many ways. They, they could videotape themselves. Mm -hmm. they could, like, just like what we're doing right here. Right. They could videotape themselves being on your show, and then they could look <laughs> at it and see what they think should be changed. It, it is intriguing, actually. I, years ago, I, when I was practicing for a talk, I had just gotten some access to some video equipment, and I thought, oh, this would be great, I'll, I'll videotape myself. Oh. It, was, it was amazing the first time you see yourself trying to talk and videotape, oh, and yes. you have no clue about all the tics and nervous mannerisms, the postures. Uh, you know, I was not at all aware of what I was doing with my hands. Mm -hmm. Just you Right, know, right, you know. right. So video is one. Observing people that they consider to be good communicators and saying, what is it that I think is so great about this person as a communicator? and trying to model some of that behavior. Or you can take classes. There's mm -hmm. Dale Carnegie, there's the Pam Chambers course, mm -hmm. there's Toastmasters right. that anyone can join, and there you would get feedback. Maybe not as much as you should, but you would get some feed feedback. And then uh, getting feedback from surveys. You, you can survey your customers and mm -hmm. say, in, in terms of our communication with you, how did we do? Mm -hmm. And ask specific questions about that. Yeah, and these days that's sort of easier and easier to do, right? There are, there are all kinds of these online apps now that allow you to do interactive uh, question and answer mm -hmm. groups in real time, mm -hmm. anonymously. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was just doing one the other day at a Rotary meeting where the, the, the speaker had one of these going and we all broke out our phones and he was asking us questions and we were watching how many people give what answer. And oh, right, there's just, a name for that. I forget is, the name. Uh, that's, that's Yeah, there's several yeah. different versions of it around Right, now. right, right, right. But uh, yeah, it's... it's and yet, people don't do it. You know, people won't. They won't give that feedback. Look often. at, is it Trip TripAdvisor? They want you to say your name. You you have to leave your name if you're going to give a review. But Yelp, you don't. Mm -hmm. You don't leave your name. Mm -hmm. So, the anonymousness makes it possibly easier to be critical. Mm -hmm. But who, like the guy with his hands back there, mm -hmm. who who what? inferior person to him is going to tell him anything about that. Right. Yeah. We're afraid to do that. Yeah. And it's, it's odd because a fair number of people do understand with that, that example that body language is, means something and you're supposed to sort of mimic the body language of somebody when you're talking with them in order to establish commonality. So it's, it's interesting to sort of envision his meetings. <laughs> well, people sort of <laughs> maybe now he's completely dropped that habit. I hope so. <laughs> Uh, what else? You asked about losing consequences, or the consequences if you lose your mm -hmm. ability to speak well, and so, or don't ever gain it in the first place. You could lose some credibility mm -hmm. if you're not a good speaker. Yeah. You could lose face yeah. if you're not a good speaker. Mm -hmm. You could lose employees if you're not a good speaker. Yeah. There's, there's a lot at stake, right. um, and I just think we're not paying enough attention to that. I, I, I tend to agree. I, I think we often don't, don't think about that enough. We're going to go more deeply into this, okay. but right now I'm told we have to take a quick break. Okay. Uh, I'm Ethan Allen. You're watching Likeable Science. I'm here with Pam Chambers, and we'll be back in a minute. Aloha. I'm Winston Welch, and every other Monday at 3 p.m., you can join me at Out and About 
a show where we explore a variety of topics, organizations, events, and the people who fuel them in our city, state, country, and world. So please join us every other Monday at 3, and we'll see you then. Aloha. Hi, I'm Pete McGuinness-Mark, and every Monday at 1 o'clock, I present Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa, where we bring together researchers from across the campus to describe a whole series of scientifically interesting topics of interest both to Hawaii and around the world. So hopefully you can join me 1 o'clock Monday afternoon for Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa. And you're back here on Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. With me today here in Think Tech Studios is Pam Chambers, speaker, author extraordinaire, public speaker, presenter, coach, all these different roles. And we're talking about her book, Not This Again, where it's 18 lessons, challenges that Hawaii's leaders face, and sort of the lessons to, on how to overcome these challenges. And yeah, we, we were speaking earlier a little bit about the, the unique nature of Hawaii. Uh, the, the, and you talk about it, one of the aspects in here about, about the, the sort of island time idea, right? Mm. And people have very different ideas. Mm. Type A people who show up always at least a few moments early for a meeting, mm -hmm. you know, would never think of being late versus people who take a much different attitude. And, you know, it, it's not to say one's right, one's wrong, but, but there are expectations in certainly in the business world. Uh, I recall the first time I was down in, in American Samoa being shocked because we had set up to do some workshops with teachers that were going to begin at four o'clock, I think. And so I'm there, of course, plenty early. Four o'clock comes and there's nobody there. 4.15, one or two people start drifting in. 4.30, a few more drift in. Quarter of five, begin to get a little bit of a crowd. Wow. You know, by five o'clock, there, there were a fair number of people there. Mm. Not a one of them apologized or, or thought, no, this was just... This was just accepted that this was wow. very normal. You know, meetings started when they started and people showed up when they showed up and that was, you know, and oh. if, if I was gonna get upset about it, that wasn't gonna do me any good, you know. Wow. <laughs> that wasn't gonna change their behavior, so. Did, did any circumstance cause them to be on time? Uh, I really haven't found, <laughs> uh, it, it's just a very, you know, very different, the mm -hmm. whole mindset. When you've grown up, particularly on, the, on these really small islands, that have been basically self-sufficient for generations. Mm -hmm. There is this whole attitude that you know things will happen when they need to happen, mm -hmm. and, and right. there's no sort of need for that level of sort of structure and organization and time slots and all because you know there, you don't need it. So why, why it's just not not in the not in the mindset. One yeah. of the contributors to this book had a really interesting point of view about Hawaii, what we call Hawaiian time. Mm -hmm. He said that he had a client who was a member of a team and his job was to do a certain task for, to contribute to this project. And he kept not turning it in. He kept not turning it in. Mm -hmm. And my friend asked him, what, what is the holdup? And he said, it's not good enough yet. Mm -hmm. It's not good right. enough yet for our team. Mm -hmm. So he was thinking about the whole group and how it would be for the team as opposed to his own. Whereas mm -hmm. I might be more, this is my job, and right. here it is. Um, yes, and again, I think that's, that highlights a, a real difference in sort of main, mainstream US culture. We are very individualistic. Mm -hmm. The islands, small islands, are forced to be much more community thinkers. Mm -hmm. You know, that they ha have to consider what is good for the group. Because when you live on a little island with 200 people who are there from the time you're born until the time you die, and nobody else, virtually, it's very important that you all get along well, that yeah. you work well together, uh, you, you, you know, and we see this. Uh, I mean, we've seen things where young, very talented kids are offered scholarships to, to go to great schools and all, and turn them down because, no, they're expected to stay on island and take care of their young cousins or nephews mm, or nieces. Right. You know, that, that's, that's the expectation, and they will forego their own betterment and their own advancement to do yes. with what the community expects for the family. sake of the yeah. group. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Well, one of the challenges here, I think, has to do with the diversity. Mm -hmm. So if we were in, oh, a big San Francisco or Boston, mm -hmm. it, we would, we, there would be more of us alike than different. Mm -hmm. But here, there are so many different cultures that as a speaker, you could look out at 100 people and there would be some people who need to be in the back row and other people who need to be in the front row and other people who will never talk no matter what you do, mm -hmm. other people that will take over 
and people with varying degrees of understanding of the English language even. Right. So, so a speaker, a leader, has to be able to play to all of that. Right, and, and understand that the subtle different signals, all right, all right if you've got a, a staff where you have people who are you know, very shy, very polite, uh, you know, by their by their cultural upbringing, mm -hmm. and other people who are brash, go get them individualists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're going to have to adjust your presentation style, as it were, to these different people to to really get the best out of both of them, right? I remember a training once that had about about half the people in the training were police officers, and the others weren't. And the ones who weren't were almost all fairly intimidated mm -hmm. by these people in uniforms with their 20-pound belts uh, who have power. Sure, and, guns. And <laughs> guns, yes. And, and it was amazing what happened when the officers were done with the, their portion of the training and excused themselves how the energy in the room changed. Really? Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, they, the people really came to life, whereas they had been suppressing, almost trying to be invisible, almost. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, uh, I mean, people do that. I mean, there, there's been wonderful uh, studies done when they, they have someone, for instance, cross an intersection against a light, and if you put the same person in the clothes, shabby clothes, looking like a bum, mm. nobody follows them. You put them in sort of normal mm. attire, a few people follow them. You put them, a uniform on them, and uh, yes. pff, right. crowds will follow them across against the light. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, because we all, again, it's, it, it's part of that whole communication Thing that we're talking about that feedback loop it's like oh well this person has and it's unspoken right yeah. it's it's not spoken and often unacknowledged even in our own uh, minds right 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 yeah. now why am i following this guy right, right. <laughs> right you wouldn't know yeah. even when we see something approaching someone and we decide i think i'm going to cross the street now mm -hmm. that's we're reading we're assessing the situation and deciding that it would be safer if we were on that side of the street. Yeah, yeah. When we have to be assessing like that. Yeah, again, this, this ties back to our, our sort of biological roots, right? We had to be very good at reading body language and, and intention uh, mm -hmm. because if you didn't, you mm -hmm. probably didn't pass on your genes, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. And you were wondering earlier about how a leader can adapt to the Hawaiian mm -hmm. culture or the culture in Hawaii, mm -hmm. I should say. Right. Uh, I think they need to have a mentor. I mean, I've seen in the 36 years that I've been here, I've seen people come and go, people mm -hmm. from the mainland in particular who mm -hmm. come and they just don't they just don't fit in. They never learn to fit in. Mm -hmm. And they may leave in in some kind of shame mm -hmm. or, or rejection even mm -hmm. because they didn't have anyone say here's how it works here. Mm -hmm. Here's what right. is expected. Here's what this means. Here's what that doesn't mean. Right. And wouldn't it be great if they had a mentor? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. wouldn't it? Yeah. To explain, right. take your shoes off, to explain, don't arrive empty handed. Even mm -hmm. if people said no gifts, right. that doesn't mean no gifts. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. I think we need to have more of that than we do. Yeah, that sort of structured mentoring is really great. My, my sister uh, did her career in the Navy, and one of the things she spoke of that I always thought was such a great idea, when she first entered as an as a ensign, you know, she'd gone through officer's candidate school, they assigned her basically a career coach officer, mm. basically, mm. whose job it was basically to say, okay, Lois, you know, they're gonna move you every two years. Now let's see, you've done this specialty, you've done this specialty, where do you wanna go? Where do we need to position you geographically, sort of professionally, mm. you know, and, and just sort of help guide her along. Oh. She, she left the Navy as a captain, so. You know. Oh my goodness, that <laughs> I've just must thought, have been very helpful. Yeah, I was, I've always, why, why don't they do this in, in, the, in the real world? <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah. Um, I mean, we're supposed to vaguely do that in academia, right? You have, you have uh, advisors at various stages, but they usually only want to track you in their pathways, right? <laughs> 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 this is what I think you need. <laughs> right, right. Um, of course, that, that is, a, again, it's a, it's a sort of a danger in leadership, right, is that, that leaders sometimes have relatively narrow views of, of what they want their followers to do, right, and um, just drive them or pull them in that one direction. That's that's a fairly arrogant attitude right. and short-sighted and not very wise. Ways to keep engagement going between leaders mm -hmm. and followers would be to get up and move around once in a while. Right. Get out, manage manage by walking around. Yeah. I heard it called once, yes. yeah. where you literally you walk around, you look, you feel the energy, you see the look on the face, you sense and 
care and investigate and you become a detective. What is going on in my company? Yeah, it's, it's funny, we, I work with a relatively small group now. Our new CEO, when he came on board base, he said, no, I'm not gonna use the CEO's office. I'm gonna sit out in the main room with everyone else. Oh, wow. And, and just, it makes a tremendous difference in terms oh. of the, sort of the ambiance of, of the place. It's like, yes. oh, wow, well, yeah, we're just all sort of sitting around here getting stuff done. Did people know? like it? Oh yeah, oh yeah, everyone, um. everyone agrees it's a much, much sort of healthier, uh, energy there. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it, it is particularly, I think, in a, in a very multicultural area like Hawaii, that, that's probably even more critical, right? If, if you've got a bunch of, if you're supervising a bunch of people who are very much like yourself, it's probably relatively easy to check in once or twice and, and know what's going on. Mm -hmm. but, but the different people with different styles, differing amounts of uh, what they're going to put out, what they're going to hide in, mm -hmm. inside, you know, it, you mm -hmm. probably need much more time to spend with them to sort of watch for the subtle signals I that agree. they aren't happy or are happy. Right, you know. and leaders need to know, one of the chapters is about, should I talk to this one guy alone or should I talk to the whole group about this thing? Right. And often people feel safer in the group, in the herd, mm -hmm. than they do separate from the herd. Right. And so to single someone out and to pull them into your office to get their input about something, you're, you're probably not going to get the truth. Yeah, that, that's a very delicate business. So there are issues that you clearly can't discuss in the group, right? And you need to. Need well, to there talk. was one um, in, story in there about a leader who found out that one of her employees ate the same stinky food every day, and <laughs> and, and the meetings after lunch were filled with <laughs> unpleasant fumes. <laughs> And she wanted me to deal with that. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, come on, let me teach you how to deal with that. And she wouldn't have any of it. So it turns out that it was the right thing to do to talk to the group about mm -hmm. that so that they wouldn't eat that same lunch, too. Right, yeah, it wouldn't, it wouldn't become a, a, a cultural thing, right? Right, oh, let's all go to, and I won't name the place, but, right. but, but there was um, kimchi and daikon involved. Yeah. Right. And, and so it would, would have been a mistake to yeah. pull him yeah. aside. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Pam, as always, it's great fun talking with you. I'm, I'm told we're running out of time. Okay. Uh, it seems like it was just a moment ago we started chatting here. But uh, again, Pam Chambers, uh, not this again, you know. It's a great book. Very <laughs> good you. for anyone, leaders or followers, to read. Thank you. Thank you, Pam, for coming on yeah. here again, and uh, we'll see you in on. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Yes, indeed. Thanks. And we'll see you next week. I'm Ethan Allen, signing off from Lakeable Science on ThinkTech Hawaii.